Okay, so um, let me do the following notation here. Um, So we're looking at uh, this ring here. So this is a ring. Uh, we, we know from the past that before. So what I want to do is I'm going to take He's out of the one class, uh, right? Um, sort of the worst of notation I want to use. Pi comes out of class one, M I comes out of class two, and Q I comes out of class. Uh, the example we did last time, I used a different notation, uh, and what we did was correct, actually. But I'm going to kind of write it in here. So if we have a power. So really, we saw that there's uh, two ways to the back of this. It's basically P1 before, P1 before. And that's the only way to break this down. We'll call this alpha. So as an element, as an element, X1 is up to a unit squared. And actually this is, this factorization is unique up to a unit. Right. Two, what if we look at an element, or let me say a principal ideal, that looks like this. Okay, so this is a variant on the first. Um, this is a variant on the first because P1 and P2 are both out of this class. So this is like what I what I what I would do if I took a previous example and replaced P1 by the second P1 by a, a different prime in the same ideal class, right? Here, of course, on P1 standard. Now you have a unique factorization here. How many factorizations? You gotta have a fear. Well, a similar argument uh, to what we did in the first case will show that any factorization of this element here was called a sense two. Any factorization of this will involve two and only two irreducibles. Right. So you've got a you've got a kind of bunch of five. So here's here's one way to do it. How else could we do this? Take one from the first prize, three from the second. Right. So it's a, it's a matter of sort of shuffling your deck, isn't it? Right. So I could go P1, P2 cubed, and then P1 cubed, P2. Uh, I'll call this gamma and delta. And hopefully there's not too many more of these because I'm going to run out three letters quickly. Um, what else could we do? Well, we could go, um, let's see, what else we got here? Yeah, squared. One, yeah. We've got four and zero, we've got one and three. I guess we could go two and two. 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 
and so I guess this was a uh, more of that thing to play. And notice when we start overloading, we're just repeating what we've done before. So this actually has three factorizations. Uh, X2 is unit one times alpha beta, or unit two times gamma delta, uh, unit three times this square. Right. So this one's got three different factorizations, but all of them are of length two, right? Just like this one. Um, what else we got? How about this? What if we had, this is one I'll let you last time, teaser, bring, So, how many factorizations do we have here? Eight choose four. Four. I don't think that's quite right, though. You're close. Because once you choose your four, the other one's chosen, right? So, all factorizations, this is very similar to the previous one. Now I've got complete variety. I'm assuming again that all these primes are distinct. All factorizations. R of length two. Uh, so x three uh, equals p i one, p i two, p i three, p i four times p i five, p i six, p i seven, p i eight. Just various permutations of this. So the question is, how many of these can we form? Uh, and it should be it should be eight choose four. That selects your seven, four, and eight, and then the other factor is determined. So you cut that in half, and this is thirty-five. Uh, this particular fun element factors, uh, every factorization uh, is a point two, and there's 35 of them. Um, Can you by chance give an example in our ring? Z for Z14? No, but you can <laughs> oh, <laughs> gather for the next homework problem. No. <laughs> so, uh, yes, I, I, I can tell you, I, here, here's what you would do. Um, I've already given you a, a prime in this class, right? I think it's three, one plus right over measure four, two. So what you would do is you would try to look for split primes that end up in that class, right? And if you think about it a little bit, you might be able to do it. And all you have to do is come up with eight of them, right? And once you've got your list of eight, just take those prime ideals and there you go. And actually, if you're a big fan of doing uh, messing around with quadratic forms, once you have your eight primes, right? So once you have your eight primes, so let's 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 take Adam's question a step further. Uh, P1, P2, P3. So you go and you find these. I mean, if nothing else, you can find them by trial and error. But once you start playing around with it, I think you will discover that it's uh, there's a systematic way to do this. 
Analysts suppose they have norms, little p1, little p2, little p3, little p4, little p5, little p6, p7, p8. Now, if you look at the norm, which this one would be x squared plus uh, 14 y squared, zero p1, p2, p3, p4, p5, p6, p7, p8, then let's see, for each one of those, you can change the sign. I guess that particular equation, if you're a fan of such things, so that'll be a big number on the right side. Start messing around with it. There should be a lot of ways to write whatever this number is as a square plus 14 times squared, right? Because um, each of these primes here, um, well, so um, right, right. Uh, each of the each of these 35 factorizations point to these 35 elements all should have. Um, well, when you you should be able to break it down into the factors that are those 35, right? So uh, the norm of so the norm of this element right here should be p1 up to p8, right? And there ought to be 35 ways to break that down into two of your reducible factorizations. Actually, more than that because you can vary it by a unit, which Admittedly, it's only plus or minus one here. So you should get a lot of solutions to this equation. Okay. Um, uh, other questions? Okay, how about this one? Um, We have this. Here's another way I can fill something. Um, what if I build this one? Let's say X. Notice I skipped X4 because I didn't. I essentially did that last time. Here. Now, uh, when the factorizations is this one. Notice one factorization is this, right? Uh, Right, this is for both principles. Uh, but how else can we form this? Sorry. Well, right, so by the way, let me point out that this is the only factorization one to do. So big blob, big blob, right? That's the only factorization point of two. Uh, what other links can we have here? Okay, so another type of factorization would be this. Here's the factorization of link four.
notice that these are each irreducible here. A1, A2, A3, A4. Because P and Q are in inverse classes, right? Now, of this type, how many do I have? There are 24. Imagine the P is being fixed and from using the cubes. Uh, 24 ways to use those cubes. And you can check yourself if you need the only type So this is kind of interesting because this one actually has different types. There's a unique factorization into two elements, and there's 24 in the quarter. Um, so, how about this one? Uh, Um, because this one is what this one is uh, And that's why there's only one way. It's actually reducible because this is out of the class two. And so it squares principle. So there's no there's no way to break that down. Um, so uh, this one I say is a, a, a little strange because Can be. Um, notice in this case that an irreducible of this form must have a square norm. So that one in the quad in the quadratic they can accept it. And we're going to talk about how norms can help and what you have to be careful about. Okay, any any questions on this? So this gets us into uh, so playing playing this game here, I think gets us into a uh, an interesting bit of combinatorial uh, algebra. So I am going to talk about something that's interesting uh, in its own right. How many of you have ever heard of Davenport? So, what, what, in what context did you hear about it? Was it just purely kind of? I mean, just in, I've been doing this so long, I've been doing this. Yeah, because I mean, this is really the Davenport constant is just something that's kind of interesting to somebody that looks at combinatorics or, or finite group theory. Uh, it's really weird that it would show up in something like factorization, but of course, that's the way math works. Uh, it's all applied. It's just a matter of time scale. Definition. So I'm going to talk about this in the context of a finite admitted group. I mean, how hard can that be, right? I mean, we have classification theorem, easy peasy lemon squeezy, right? So let's let G be a finite 
a million birds. Uh, we say uh, we say the sequence or sometimes the G sequence of elements from a group by its sequence. But just take a collection of elements of the group, not necessarily distinct. In fact, it may be the case in my statement that I use the same element all of the times. Um, is a zero sequence. So what does it mean for this to be a zero sequence? If when you add them up, you get zero. So that's what I mean by a zero sequence here. It just means you add this stuff up and it gets zero. Uh, That's what a zero sequence is. Uh, we say that the sequence has a zero subsequence. Zero subsequence. Yeah, there is a subsequence summing to zero. Uh, no surprise there. Let me give it to you more precisely. Uh, there it says uh, one, uh, two, three, and such that. Um, GI one plus GI two plus GI K. So a zero subsequence is just a sub collection of this that sums to zero, not empty, and uh, it could be. The whole sequence. So if it's a zero sequence, it, it has a zero subsequence, namely using the whole thing. So that's what a zero sequence is, zero subsequence. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Davenport constant, what it is in two different ways. Uh, let me give you an example first. Um, suppose Uh, by the way, for your convenience, I'll list the elements of the group. It certainly has a zero subsequence because it's got a zero, right? Uh, but how about something more interesting? Uh, Sequence certainly with no proper zero subsequence. So, in other words, the only uh, zero subsequence is the whole thing itself. Um, You look at three. This is not a zero sequence. 
because one plus two plus three is two, uh, but it does have a zero subsequence. namely one and three. Uh, neither, let's say, one, one, uh, or one, two, have any zero subsequence. Definition. Three. Three. Well, your favorite five building group. We define the Davenport constant of G uh, to be So here's my notation for that. It's the minimum value of n such that there exists um, um, given a sequence uh, and the elements there must be a zero substance. So what the Davenport constant is, is it is the smallest n such that if you have a, uh, any collection of n elements that group, there must be in your collection some zero subset, right? What's the Davenport constant for the identity group? Well, one, right? Because the only element that you have is okay. What's the Davenport constant for Z2? Well, um, I can certainly pick a, uh, a sequence of one element that has no zero subsequence, just pick the element that's not the identity. Well, so how about two? Well, how can I pick two elements out of the group of two elements? Well, if I ever pick the identity, I've got a zero subsequence, so I can forget about that. So the only way that I can really effectively pick two elements is to pick the non-identity element twice, but now I've got a zero subsequence. So the Davenport constant of uh, what's the Davenport constant uh, of group of order three? Seems pretty obvious, isn't it? Right? That it's going to be three. Can I pick a, a, a sequence of, of length two that that has no zero subsequence? Certainly, I can just go one one. Right. Now, how many subsets of three things do I have? All right. Well, let's see. I can never have the identity in there. I can never have zero in there. 
So once I pick one of the elements, I guess it doesn't matter which one I pick because one and two are both generators, right? There's an automorphism to that group. So let's suppose that I pick one, right? Once I pick one, I can't pick two, right? So to keep going, I've got to pick one. That's got a zero subsequence, right? And now I've got one and one. Well, I can't pick zero and I can't pick two, so I have to pick one. And so it looks like it's three, right? But notice that I had to argue a little bit more than I did for yeah. two. So what's the Davenport constant of the group, a cyclic group, even? We'll make it cyclic. Of, well, I was really thinking uh, eight, six, seven, five, three, eight, nine. <laughs> but that's going to take a while, right? Uh, I guess we need some theorems. Uh, let me point out that actually, I don't have to go that extreme. What's this one? Okay, so fast. What's that? They play well and nicely with direct signs. What's that? They play well and nicely with direct signs. It goes twice. Yeah. And, and I'm not kidding. So it, the, the funny thing about Davenport, the Davenport constant is this. This is this is a Gilligan's Island problem uh, in the sense that I think that I can explain it to you. So uh, give me a formula for the Davenport constant for finite abelian group. Let me let me do some spoilers here. The Davenport constant for a cyclic group is the order of the group. The Davenport constant for a P group is known. The Davenport constant for the direct sum of two cyclic groups is known if the order of the first one divides the second one. So if it's uh, an invariant factor decomposition. That's very I was thinking about this connection all day. For, for, for three. And the standard formula, and the same type of formula works for all the cases that are known, right? And that formula, let's see, now that there may be more research, I should probably go look this up. But the formula, the standard that works for, it's a, the, the same type of formula works for P groups, cyclic groups, uh, uh, two invariant factor groups works. That same formula does not work for four invariant factors. And three is a big fat question mark. And so what I mean by Gilligan's Island problem is if you think, okay, I'm going to go home and just pound this out while I watch Gilligan's Island on the TV, and you quickly realize that you ain't going to fix the minnow. Right, I mean, you you were stuck on that island. So anyway, so let's let's uh, let me let me give you something else about the Davenport constant. This is, and I'm probably going to ask you to prove this, and you'll be grateful because it's not hard to prove. Um, so here's an alternate definition of the Davenport constant. VG is the maximum. It's the maximum M such that there exists a zero uh, sequence of M elements of G. No proper single subsequence. So I'll take it as given uh, an exercise to prove equivalent to these two. Uh, it's either the smallest number such that given any collection of that many elements of the group, possibly with repetition, you're guaranteed a zero subsequence. This one is the maximum. It's the length of the longest zero sequence you can ever build, but has no proper zero subsequence. 
it's convenient to know both of these points of view uh, moving forward. Okay. Um, so here's an example. Let me give you some. Uh, I'm going to give you some. So I challenge you to kind of figure these out. It's not too hard to figure these out because these are kind of small. Z2, Z2. Uh, I'm going to make these sickle ones obsolete in just a moment. <laughs> Now I'm mixing my chip a little bit. This is five. Well, there's some fun ones that come to practice and we'll see how this how this works. Okay, so here is a first proposition, right? Because I don't know about you all, but well, can anybody give me a naive upper bound? Well, I don't know if it's so naive or not, because I don't think at the start of it all, it's very obvious. So, so is it clear to you all that if you have a finite abelian group, then the Davenport constant is definitely going to be finite, right? I mean, there's no way that you can take an infinite string of elements. You've got to have some zero set of sum, right? Because at least one of the elements has to be repeated infinitely often. Every element has finite order. So there you go, right? So if I have a, an infinite list from a finite group, one of those things has to be repeated infinitely often. And there you go. Can anybody give me something a little bit better than less than infinity? What's that? Antidepotal. <laughs> well, and, and of course, what's in? The, the order of the group? Yeah. Uh, she is correct. Can anybody do better? Just the order of the group. How about the order of the group, right? I bet your proof is easier than mine. <laughs> so, um, let F be a finite uh, abelian group. Then Davenport constant G is left bound equal to the G. Okay, so that's that's something, right? So if I've got a group of order eight, six, seven, five, three, or nine, I know it's got to be less than that, right? Um, so Now what I'm going to do is uh, so let's consider this uh, here in sequence, or consider the sequence. Two G uh, N. So let's just consider, so this is basically, um, I'm adding up the sequence of n plus r elements. I'm going to make a claim if r is bigger than zero, then there exists a zero subsequence. Um, right. Uh, and 
times for you to catch on my notation that it's already zero in there. Um, so uh, let's let me record the following information here. And is the order of two? Uh, yes, 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 yes. yes. Here. Okay, so let me just do this this way. Okay, so let's let's consider this. Uh, I feel like I'm not in my linear algebra class now. Um, consider these uh, full. Um, right. Um, now, the first thing I want to point out is. Uh, Right. Uh, by the way, if one of these turns out to be zero, then I've got a zero subsequence, right? Well, let's just suppose, for the sake of argument, that none of them turn out to be zero. What does that mean uh, about that list there? two of the elements are the same. Uh, that's right. Then, as the order of G then must be the case. That Xi is equal to Xj. For some I not equal to J. Do I agree? Uh, and in fact, let me be more specific. Let me say that without loss of generality. And so what happens if xi and xj are the same? Well, this means that x1 is to xi. Now, these, of course, and g1 plus g2 plus gi plus gi plus one. Each A is XJ. Notice that uh, if these two are equal, then their difference, let's say XJ minus XI is zero, which is GI plus one, GJ. And this is a zero subsequence. And so that's what we want there. So elements of G must have a zero subsequence. Well, the Davenport constant is the minimal number in which this happens. So Davenport constant is less than or equal to n, which is the order of G. Okay. Uh, 
All right, does anybody spy a corollary to this? You know, cyclic. Say that. Yeah. Davenport constant. Okay, so there's kind of our first big foray into this is the Davenport constant of uh, a cyclic group is in fact the order of truth. Uh, proof. How do we know that? Okay, so that, that's right. So the Davenport constant is the minimal. Uh, so we know by previous the Davenport constant of G is less than or equal to G. Uh, as G is cyclic. Uh, G is isomorphic to ZN. Right, I'm going to use ZN because it's convenient. And note that one, 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 in times, well, actually, I'll write, I'll do the price that other than minus one times is a zero, um, is an n minus one sequence with no proper uh, zero subsequence. Or no, let me take that word proper, no zero subsequence. Right. And the key here is, of course, one is the additive generator, and so there's no way that a subsequence of that can be zero because that would contradict the fact that this order in. Right. Any questions on that? Okay, uh, that's enough for today. We will continue with our foray into this on Friday.